Let's bring in our think tank tonight. Joining us in Atlanta, criminal defense attorney and the president of the Georgia Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, Lawrence Zimmerman. In the Bronx, New York, criminal defense attorney, Renee Hill. And in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, family law attorney, Jennifer Brandt. All right, everyone ready? It was the defense that was presenting evidence today, exhibits. So I want to go through some of these exhibits with you and, and figure out how all this is going to play at trial and what it tells us and what it might tell a jury. Let's begin uh, with the first image uh, that was presented today to the investigator, and it's um, some identified person who is kicking Rittenhouse, and you also see one of the victims with his skateboard. Take a listen. You've seen this photograph? Correct. And that is who I will, an unidentified individual who I will refer as to jump kick man, kicking my client, correct? Correct. You can see my client being knocked backwards in this photograph, correct? Correct. So contact was made, correct? Yes, sir. And as Kyle is being knocked backwards, you see an individual with a skateboard approaching my client, correct? Yes, sir. And based upon the clothing and the straps, who is that? That's Anthony Huber, sir. Okay. And he has just retrieved his skateboard from swinging at it, trying to hit Kyle earlier, correct? Correct. All right, Lawrence, I'll start with you. And that image is so, shown to a jury. Who's the victim? Well, certainly just based on the image, Vinny, it looks like Rittenhouse is being attacked by uh, a guy kicking, kick man, is that what he called him? And then Huber coming over the skateboard. There's a lot of chaos going on, so I'm not sure exactly, or he didn't hear what happened moments before that. Was Huber and, and kick man, uh, you know, afraid of Rittenhouse? Were they trying to, to stop him with the firearm? You know, there's certainly a self-defense claim here. I'm not going to deny that, and it may be a good one. They haven't charged him with intentional homicide, just a reckless act that caused a homicide. Yeah, well, the, the, the um, Mr. Richards, the defense attorney, he's definitely setting up this self-defense claim here. And, you know, preliminary hearings are usually very succinct and very, um, for the prosecution, they, they don't put out very much. They only want to put just enough to show that there's probable cause for their case. And that seems to be what they did here. But the defense, on the other hand, they showed their cards, as you said. And not only did they show their cards, but they're lining up and putting the officer in a position for them to be able to keep him to his word at the trial. They're locking him into certain testimony that is favorable to the defense to show that Rittenhouse was acting in self-defense. That's what he's going to want to argue. And they were also getting the pictures out in the public, which I think is really important. I mean, we're looking at these pictures and we're saying, wow, this kid looks like he was being attacked by all these people. And you see photo after photo. It really looks like, wow, this was a self-defense. I mean, just as a member of the public, I think the defense is very effective in trying to sway public opinion in favor of their client. They've been doing it from the beginning. I mean, they released their own uh, video version of what they say happened that night. Let's get to the next exhibit, and, and this involves uh, Anthony Huber. His father, again, was in on the Zoom hearing today, and he's the, the victim who gets shot and killed. He's the one with the skateboard. Let's take a listen. You testified on direct examination that Mr. Huber tries to hit my client in the shoulder neck area, correct? Correct. He hits him in the back of the head. Is that a fair statement based upon Exhibit 8? The, the picture is a freeze frame. It's hard to see the actual motion of it. I mean, contact's definitely near the back of the head, but I couldn't say there's direct contact. On the early morning hours of August 26th, you took a photograph of a large bump on the back of my client's head where he had turned himself in at the Antioch Police Department, correct? I did not take that photograph. My partner did. Okay. You've seen that photograph, correct? Correct. And that photograph was on my client's head, not his shoulder or neck. Fair statement? Correct. All right. There's some nuance with this. And Renee, I'm going to start with you. So 
On the one hand, um, Anthony Huber and his father, who is absolutely heartbroken, I understand it, has described his son as a hero, someone who is, is trying to take down a gunman, okay? And he's using his skateboard, trying to take down this gunman. There was a second uh, image that was shown today in, in court where Huber is grabbing Kyle Rittenhouse's gun after, after striking him in the head with the skateboard. So here's my question. I, I'm trying to figure out, okay, if you are pursuing someone, are you allowed, if, you've, if there's a gunman out there, are you allowed to hit him with a skateboard and, and go after his gun? Is, is that lawful action by Huber? Is it lawful action by Rittenhouse if someone is, is trying to take his gun away from him after hitting him in the head with a skateboard? Is he then allowed to use lethal force? How does this thing, how does this thing flush out? Well, yeah, I mean, these are the questions that the jurors are going to have to answer when they're viewing the evidence in this case. And, you know, we don't know what happened before the video started to play. Um, and, and that's the question. And that's what the prosecution. Well, is going we, we kind of know what happened. To, to witnesses. We, we know that Kyle Rittenhouse got into a, an altercation with Joseph Rosenbaum. And, um, there, you know, there's going to be different versions of exactly what happened there. But we know that Kyle Rittenhouse shot and killed Rosenbaum, and then leaves that scene, and, there, and then the mm -hmm. video picks up, and there's Kyle Rittenhouse walking, and there's a crowd behind him following him. What does this all mean, Jennifer? Right. But well, 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 the, I, I'm sorry, I, I know that went to Jennifer. I just wanted to reiterate I, that we don't know what happened before the video started to roll. So if they're pursuing him because of his actions, they may have a right to do that and try to stop him from harming someone else. I, I mean, I agree with Renee there on that point that if we don't know if they were following him because Rosenbaum had already been shot, that's one thing. But getting back to the question about the skateboard and the gun, I mean, it looks pretty bad there in that picture that he was being hit with a skateboard. And certainly if it was an injury to his head, that's pretty serious. But then again, is shooting someone the right response in, you know, when you're hit with a, an object or, you know, uh, there's a tussle on the ground. The problem is that Kyle Rittenhouse had a gun and he used it and it killed somebody. So I think that's really, well, you know, what the jury is going to consider here. Was that really um, suf a sufficient or a, a response, a proper response to being hit? The way he was, or was it truly self-defense? Was he fearing for his life? I think that's what we're going to have to look at at the trial. And and there's it all. It's playing out right there on that video, Lawrence. This is a very different. I mean, it, it depends on the filter that you're looking at this through, right? I mean, some people are looking at it through like this is a, a gunman on the loose, and these are are citizens trying to track him down and and, and tackle a gunman. Uh, on the other hand, Kyle Rittenhouse says, I just uh, was protecting my own life from someone who tried to attack and corner me, so I had to shoot him, and then I'm trying to get away from this crowd and this mob that's following me. Yeah, so it's a very chaotic situation, obviously, and this is very unique. So we need to look at it from the way that the state has charged it. They're saying that him having this gun made it reckless, it was a dangerous weapon, and that was part of the recklessness. So if he legally possessed that gun, then they could, you know, they have a better claim of self-defense. But the prosecution's trying to say, hey, he has AR-15. That in of itself was reckless under Wisconsin law, and it, it was a dangerous weapon. And so maybe that's what started causing these issues, and Rosenbaum runs up, he shoots him, supposedly defending himself. And I guess if someone else, you know, Huber sees him, uh, Rosebaum getting shot, so Huber wants to be the hero, and arguably probably may have been the right thing to do, unfortunately. Um, he got shot and tries to attack him to take the gun away. Then the question becomes, well, what does Rittenhouse believe? Is you know, Was he justified the first time? What did Huber think? I mean, so it's, it's all over the place, but if he's justified shooting Rosenbaum, I think he may be justified in shooting Huber because he was on the ground and obviously you're being attacked and hit by a skateboard, he, he did what he only could do at the time was to, uh, to pull the trigger to protect his life. Possibly those are his, his defenses. Got one more exhibit I want to go through. This one involves the, the third victim. He survived, was part of the a Zoom hearing today. Gage Grosskreutz is his name. And in this image, um, the victim, you see he's got a handgun uh, in his hand as well. Let's take a listen. Showing you what's been marked as Exhibit 10. 
This is Mr. Huber holding his chest, dropping his skateboard on the ground in the floor of the image, correct? Yes, sir. Mr. Grossowitz is surrendering to my client, putting his hands up, correct? His hands are up, correct. Okay. And in his right hand, you can see the butt of a nine millimeter handgun, correct? I couldn't tell you caliber, sir, but there's a firearm in his hand. All right, so the timing of that, that's after uh, Anthony Huber has been shot. So now uh, Grosskreutz, who's got a handgun in his hand, approaches um, Rittenhouse, then backs up, but then in a second image that we see, he's, he approaches him again and points that handgun at Kyle Rittenhouse. How, does, how do we sort through that, okay? So one person has just been shot in the presence of this other uh, a person who's got a gun. So does he have the right to point the gun at Rittenhouse because Rittenhouse has just shot someone? Or does Rittenhouse have the right to shoot him because he's pointing the gun at him? Jennifer, my head's going to explode. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't think anybody has the right to point a gun at anybody. But I think once, I think if there's any self-defense for Rittenhouse, this is it. I mean, he has a gun. And there's that one image that we've seen where he has a gun pointed directly at him. And, and he shoots. And I think it was a question. It was almost like a duel. You know, who was going to shoot first? I think, uh, you know, that's probably what Rittenhouse is going to say um, when he, as part of his defense, because he was being directly threatened at that point. And whether the other guy had the right to pull that gun after he saw his friends or companions being shot, that's a different question. But I think at that instance, you know, Kyle Rittenhouse shooting at him was, was probably justified as self-defense. I, I would definitely argue that. Right, and I think have, that's pretty convincing. We have 10 seconds. Who wants the last word? I was going to say, um, I, I, I see a future say, law school test exam here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And, uh, th that's, his, th that's his greatest strength right there, the gun being pointed at him. He's meeting force with, with force. Okay. With equal force with equal force. Speaking about equal force versus equal force, the attorneys in this case, like oil and water, uh, both brought a lot of attitude to today's hearing and, and, and are very good as well. We're going to take a look at their arguments and their presence and, and what it's going to be like in a courtroom in front of a jury. That's next. In your investigation and looking at all the hours of videos, did you ever see Kyle act inappropriate towards somebody who was not threatening him with a firearm? Objection, relevance. Again, I'm going to sustain. I, I, I'm just doesn't want to hear the truth. Uh, Mr. Richards, here's the key. You have an opportunity at trial, but we're here at preliminary hearing. I understand perhaps you're frustrated, but perhaps we continue the examination. What I tell you, wait, wait till they get inside a courtroom together. You can't handle the truth. All right. Um, let's take a listen to a little bit more of Mark Richards. He's the defense attorney for Kyle Rittenhouse. Um, he and the prosecutor both. I mean, they come in there. Their personalities are a little bit different, um, but both are strong personalities. And when they start button heads, it's fireworks. Let's take a look. When one looks at the laundry list of charges the state came up with against my client, it's clear that if, in fact, this gun was a short-barreled rifle, he would have been charged with the felony count of possession of a short-barreled rifle, contrary to the statute, with additional penalties. The government talked about, well, this is for hunting and things like this. There are two other prohibitions that are set forth in the statute. Wisconsin Stat 29.304 only applies to people who are under the age of 16. Consequently, it does not apply to Kyle. The criminal complaint lays or sets forth my client's birth date. He was 17 on August 25th, 1920, excuse me, 2020. As to 29593, that has to do with hunter certification. If an individual is out hunting, and that's what Mr. Binger was hanging his hat on, there is no allegation anywhere 
that my client was hunting on August 25th, 2020. So it does not meet the requirements of statute 948.63. The statute is clear on its face, must be construed strictly to my client's benefit. Additionally, what the government is trying to seek is an impingement of my client's second, second Amendment rights, which is not covered by this statute. It's very specific regarding when it's a misdemeanor, what it applies to, and the, there's basically three prohibitions, none of which are met. The statutory um, history, which is included in the brief, makes that clear. Count six should be dismissed. You know, it's not just what he's saying, but it, it's how he's saying it, some of the body language. Let's bring back in the think tank, and let, let's talk about um, how you present yourself in a courtroom in front of a jury. Because um, every time he's appeared somewhere, this defense attorney has just appeared like, this is outrageous. This should not even be in a courtroom. This, I mean, how does that play? Uh, Lawrence, you're the one giggling, right? Go ahead. <laughs> Well, I mean, I know I'm on court TV a lot, but I do try a lot of cases. So um, typically for me, if I just have a hearing in front of a judge and it's a prelim or whatever motions, I'm a little bit more aggressive with my tone and more theatrical, um, more of an attitude because there's no jury there. And it could be a lot harsher on my cross-examination with the police officer, sort of like this gentleman is doing, Mr. Richards. But with a jury, you got to be real careful. With a jury, you want them to like you. I know that is absolutely part of the deal when you're a trial lawyer because you have to convince them to like you and your client so they'll listen to you. And you have to earn their respect. And the only time you should get angry and have theatrics in the court is when the jury gives you permission to do that. So you got to really you know, wait, be patient. As your case moves along in trial, you can be theatrical. We got to be careful and be respectful. You could fight for your client, be very aggressive, but do it in a very measured way. It's different when you're just in front of the judge. You could pound the table, do everything until the judge says stop. Um, it's just, I think it's a little bit different. In my, that's how, my approach, at least. Renee, let me yeah, ask you about, I, about I going after the prosecutor, though, mm -hmm. because these two, as, I, I, you know, at least from what I've seen, they, they, they don't look like they get along. They see things completely mm -hmm. differently, and they're both sort of sarcastic in their own way when they talk about the issues in this case. Right. And, you know, like Lauren said, you have to be very careful on how you behave in front of the jury because the judge is at most times going to admonish you if you're doing something that you shouldn't be doing, if you're being sarcastic, um, and, and you don't want to be admonished in front of the jury. You want to come in. You want to be confident. You want to get your point across. And you, you don't want to come across as being arrogant because the jury is not going to like you. You don't want to um, be disrespectful to your adversary because the jurors are not necessarily going to like that either. You know, I've had plenty of trials where they, my adversaries were people that I didn't care for, but you, you keep that at bay. <laughs> and I'm saying it very nicely. You keep it at bay. And, and you know... You, you present yourself in a way that you want the jury to like you, as Lawrence said. You want them to listen to you, and they're not going to do that, or they're going to tune you out, or they're going to think you're a joke if you are behaving in a certain way that is disrespectful that they don't like. All right, let's... So, yeah. Jennifer. Vince, I, Vince I, I disagree with my colleagues here because I think that Mr. Richards is very effective, and I think he would do very, very well in front of a jury because he has a lot of passion for his client. And I think it is important in this case to, for him to show that this is ridiculous because that's what he really thinks and that's what he feels and that's what he's going to want the jury to think, that this was self-defense, that the state is just overreaching and coming after his client in the way that they are. And I think he should be a little bit indignant about it. So I, I disagree. I don't think he can be so nice. I don't think this is a situation where he should be overly nice. I don't think he's being rude. I think he's being effective uh, and a good well, advocate. What, I, That's what I say. Just, I don't just, think that, I, just I'm not saying purposes, that he should yeah. be nice. I, right, you know, I'm not you, saying that but, either. But you don't have to be <laughs> arrogant at all, you know. I, mean, I don't you think he's being arrogant, and you should be, Listen, I think I he's, I think he's being passionate. Yeah, and I, mean, I, I don't think he's being arrogant. You are fighting for your client. That's what right. you have to do, I'm, show your passion, but you can do it in a way that you don't turn the jury off either. 
but definitely be passionate in your cause. Listen, Vinny's Vinny's question was specifically about the differences between having a prelim and then in front of a jury. I was just explaining the difference. I didn't say that he did anything wrong whatsoever. I thought he did a great job. I was just saying sometimes in front of a jury, you may just sort of dial it back just a little bit until you have the permission to move forward and then hammer people. You just can't be you can't be 100% full speed every single second of a jury trial. It's going to tire you out and tire the jury out. You got to be, you know, you got to take a turn and be measured way, about though. it. I mean, you could see how he is. This is just a preliminary hearing and he is kind of aggressive and that's just, he's firing off these questions and he is, I think that's just his way of, of, of acting. I, I really don't think I don't know. I've never seen, I don't I've never think seen he's going to get tired out. We shall see. We shall see. We got a lot more to cover tonight. Um, I'd like to, you know, I, I try to do it for three hours a day and I get tired. I can't imagine doing a, a trial where it's like seven, eight hours a day, day after day with the world watching. All right. When we come back, we're going to go on the docket. Uh, that tragic case out of Tennessee involving little baby Evelyn, her mom back in court on murder charges. The big issue now looming over this case. Will they seek the death penalty? Evelyn. Ha. Hmm. 15-month-old baby Evelyn Boswell, a beautiful blue-eyed toddler from Tennessee, being raised by her teen mom Megan, goes missing with an Amber Alert issued on February 19th, 2020. We remain committed and continue to do everything possible to find out what happened to Evelyn. Uh, and as always, as soon as relevant information and accurate information, I want to I want to really reiterate that as it comes to us, uh, we will get that out as soon as possible. OK, uh, anyone with relevant information concerning Evelyn's whereabouts are asked to call 1-800-TBI-FIND. But that Amber Alert was not issued on the day she went missing. Baby Evelyn actually disappeared in late 2019. And her mom said she didn't report her missing because she knew the person who had her and did not want them to take off with her. I've told TBI where to find her in Mendota. My mom took her to a campground and a silver camper. And if they don't go tonight, I'm going to go find her myself. Just bring her back. I just want her back. That's all I want. <laughs> I've been so long without her. We're like, oh, why didn't you put it missing earlier? Because my mom threatened me, and I just want her back. That's all I can think about is how much I just want her back. But investigators were not buying Megan Boswell's stories. Aware that we've received a number of conflicting, inaccurate statements from the mother, Megan Boswell, Evelyn's mother. What happens next is a strange string of events. First, Evelyn's grandmother, Angela, is arrested with her boyfriend in North Carolina for possession of a stolen vehicle, which was part of the Amber Alert. Then Evelyn's mom is arrested in Tennessee for making false statements. We determined that some of the statements Megan Boswell provided to us were false. Many of the false statements that Megan made delayed our investigations and uh, also got in, impeded our investigations on trying to find Evelyn. As a result, she has been charged with false reporting. Any questions about that? Ms. Bobby, any questions about that? Then big breaking news. Two weeks after Evelyn was reported missing, a toddler's remains are found. This evening, we received the information that led TBI agents and Sullivan County detectives to a property belonging to a family member of Evelyn's mother in the 500 block of Muddy Creek Road in Blumpel. During the search, investigators discovered human remains believed to be those of a 15-month-old girl. The remains will be sent for an autopsy and a positive identification. So now the question is, what happened to baby Evelyn and who is responsible? And prosecutors say that person responsible is baby Evelyn's own mother. Megan Boswell, she's now been charged with her murder and was in court today. Let's take a look at uh, the prosecutor talking about a potential penalty enhancement. Your Honor, as discovery has been our main focus and uh, been very voluminous, but we've turned over you know, that to Mr. Sproles uh, earlier this week. There's still a, a little bit left, but the vast majority of it has been now turned over to Mr. Roles. And as, as far as the 
enhanced punishment, I would ask the court, because our focus has been on collecting uh, the discovery, getting defense, if, uh, that we have another final announcement date on the enhanced punishment. Well, I'll also note that, um, for the record, that um, the COVID-19 numbers are really going crazy here in this county. Um, has that in, inhibited you from being able to that has slowed down a lot make of our, the decision? Uh, visiting, ha having sit down conversations with individuals has been limited. We've tried to limit it because of the number of office. We still do see people, but it's uh, we curtail that. And this is one of those things where we need to have a conversation and it needs to be a person. So it'd be much preferred to maybe if we could uh, roll this over to late January or to February. Mr. No, Judge, we don't have any objection to that, and, and I concur. We we've been focused on the discovery and just having it for a few days. I can see how much uh, it is, and I'm sure that they work diligently on it. Um, so I, I I don't have any objection at all to that, Judge. All right, how about January twenty second? Looks like January twenty second will be the date where the decision. Uh, is going to be made. Are they going to seek the death penalty against the teen mom, Megan Boswell, for the murder of little baby Evelyn? Let's bring back in the think tank. Um, this is a heartbreaking case. This little baby would have been uh, two years old. Um, didn't make it. They believe Megan Boswell is the one responsible. Um, how does the death penalty change this case, Renee? If, in fact, on the 22nd, prosecutors come in and say, hey, we are seeking the ultimate punishment for the ultimate crime uh, for this victim, little baby Evelyn. I think if the prosecution makes that announcement, it's going to, I believe that it will slow down the process of actually getting this case to trial because I think the defense will make an application um, to see if they can change that. They're not going to want to try this as a capital case. So if they can appeal that decision um, moving forward, they will do that. And then, of course, that's going to slow down the process of this case actually going to trial as soon as they might want it to or as soon as the prosecution might want it to. That's, that's the first thing that comes to my mind as to how it's going to affect this case. You know, Jennifer, when, when, when we have cases like this, a lot of times people say, no, this isn't, this, not, this isn't a death penalty case. This, and then I, I say to them, I say, listen, what if it was some stranger, some creepy guy who took that baby and murdered that baby? People would be lining up down the street for the death penalty. But because it's the mother, the person that the child relies upon for everything Somehow, people think that's a mitigating factor. I, I don't understand that, Jennifer. I think it's because, you know, it's very hard to believe that a mother would be that creepy guy. I mean, that would go and intentionally harm their own child. I think it's still, we see it time and time again. These cases, unfortunately, come up all the time. But yet, it's very hard for people to wrap their heads around that and think that if this happened, you know, it was some accident or was something that, you know, she didn't mean to do. I think that's how most of us feel. And that's why it is hard to accept this as a death penalty case. You know, it's different than if it was just a stranger that came yeah. in and, and harmed this baby. I, I mean, I just... I know you're just you making the arguments. I know you, you're making the you arguments. look at her, well, but Vinny, I mean, Vinny, I think that's Vinny. people have feel. Vinny, look... First of all, let's. There should be. There should be no death penalty, whether it's a stranger or the mom. But if you want to talk about it in this situation, well, let, let's, she's wait, wait, she's not, Lawrence, it's the law, Lawrence. It's the law yeah, in Tennessee. They have the death she's penalty. Se she's, she's seventeen. Her boyfriend was eighteen or so. You're gonna give the death penalty to a, a, a child. You, let's just pretend that she killed her child. There's a lot of mitigation there. At seventeen, she doesn't know how to handle the child. There's a lot of studies about young. Mothers who aren't equipped that act out. I've represented people before who have been charged with killing their children. Um, th there's a lot of psychology there. Th they're not going to get the death penalty in this case. I am pretty confident that a jury is not going to sentence a 17-year-old to death that 
wasn't equipped to handle a, handle a child. Now, the Tennessee prosecutors may be trying to angle this to get a plea out of her, so they're threatening her with the death penalty, and then they come at her with a different offer of maybe life in prison or 25 years, and then maybe she'll take that because she, she doesn't want to go to trial facing the death penalty. That may be their angle. Renee? That's a possibility. Yeah, I mean, that that's certainly a possibility. I agree with Lawrence that they may be using that just as a tool to try to work out a, uh, a plea here. And again, but let, but also, let me ask you this, Renee. Let me get back to my original mm -hmm. question. All right, let's take – Lawrence makes a great point. When you make a great point, yes. Lawrence, you know I acknowledge it, and, it, and it's the youth. I understand. <laughs> the youth. But let's take, let's take the age out of the equation, and, and let's, it, we're not talking specifically about Megan Boswell. But why is it when a stranger kills a child, people line up with pitchforks, but if it's the mother, all of a sudden it's a mitigating factor – that a, that a parent would take the life of their child, that a mother would take the life of the child, that that should not be in the same category as a stranger? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it's a mitigating factor, but I agree with Jennifer that, you know, what pulls at people's heartstrings when you have these cases is just the disbelief that it could come at the hands of a parent, at the hands of a mother. That's what makes it that much more difficult for someone to wrap their head around. And, and so... You know, I'm opposed to the death penalty as well. When you have cases like this, you the first thing that comes to mind is, yes, throw them under the jail. You want them to suffer, but you have to remember it has to first be proven that the, well, the yeah, person but you make the decision. did it. But, and, you know, it, it's, a, it's hard. It's really hard in these cases because you want to go after them with the pitchforks, whether it's a stranger or not. When you look at look at the face, look at these little kids. How could anyone harm that child? How could exactly. anyone yeah. harm and that yeah. child? And it makes it Beautiful. that much Beautiful difficult child. to determine. Absolutely. It's you, can't, right. you, can't, you, you can't be so upset about someone being murdered, but yet want to put someone to death yourself. You're either pro-life or you're not. All right. Well, we will argue the death penalty on another day, Lawrence. I promise. We'll come back and we'll go. We already the have several <laughs> times, Ben. We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll do it again. We'll do it again. All right. When we come back, it's time to hear from you, the 13th juror, all about the big story of the day, Kyle Rittenhouse. Who was more persuasive today? Was it the prosecutor or the defense? Your verdict when we return. There's no dispute in this case that Kyle Rittenhouse armed himself with an AR-15 on August 25th, 2020, at the age of 17 years old. That's it. It's that simple. Now, if the defense wants to hide behind hunter safety regulations to try and excuse that behavior, then I'll simply quote back what attorney Richards just said, which is, the defendant wasn't hunting. It wasn't hunting season. This wasn't a kid who went up north with his dad and a shotgun and went hunting for deer like last week during hunter, or hunting season here in Wisconsin. This was a situation in which a teenager went running around the streets of Kenosha after curfew with a very dangerous weapon. And this is exactly why we have this law, because a teenager in this case killed two people and shot a third, because teenagers shouldn't be allowed to run around with dangerous weapons because bad things happen. They don't have the judgment, they don't have the experience. We don't trust them with these weapons because of exactly what happened in this case. Now, the defense seems to construe this statute as requiring that we plead their affirmative defense. I don't construe it that way. There is no requirement that we allege that the subsection 3C exception doesn't apply to the defendant. There is no dispute, it doesn't apply to him. No one is alleging he's complied with hunter safety regulations or has a certificate or has done the class or that this was hunting in the traditional sense of the word. This was hunting humans, not deer. Strong, passionate argument there from the prosecutor. You saw the reaction from the defense attorney. His arguments as passionate. This is one where I'm telling you folks, when they get inside that courtroom, look out. Anyway, both sides presenting their cases today during the preliminary hearing. But who was more persuasive, the prosecution or the defense? We put it up as our 13th juror question, and we begin with our 13th juror comment of the day coming from Bridget tonight. I hope they have more facts and solid evidence because I've watched numerous videos, and so far I cannot find him guilty if I was on the jury. Just my opinion, but so far I see the defense having a stronger case 
time will tell. Lauren Zimmerman, this was not, um, Bridget was not alone. I mean, we had a lot of viewers who were saying, you know what, the defense has something here. Are you surprised? No, the defense made great points, and I disagree with the prosecutor. If he says Rittenhouse was hunting people, then why did he charge with, charge with intentional murder rather than a reckless act? He's trying to hang his hat on the fact that a 17-year-old shouldn't have that type of firearm. But again, if it's legal, that's not the issue. The question comes down to self-defense. So I mean, even though probable cause is a very low standard, so there's obviously they're going to bind it over for a trial. But I feel the defense made some very good points and got out in the for public relations purposes and and for future juries to see that they do have a good defense potentially. Absolutely, Mike. Tonight, I hope this kid gets a fair trial. This hearing doesn't seem too fair. He rightfully defended himself. Jennifer Brent, I hope this kid, do you, do you think that's what the jury is going to see inside the courtroom as a kid? I think somewhat. And I think they'll play that up, that he was a teenager at the time. He's still a teenager. He's, a, he's young. Um, and he was, with all those pictures and the video, you know, looking like he was being threatened and he was acting in self-defense. Uh, I, they persuaded a couple of our 13th jurors, so I, I think they're, the defense is being very, very effective. Yeah, it's more than a couple. Trust me, Jennifer, it's more than a couple. Elder tonight writes, I served in the U.S. Navy protecting my country. Thank you for your service, Elder. This guy wasn't protecting. He went there with the purpose of assaulting people. He needs to be put away forever. Absolutely no chance of parole. Renee, do you think prosecutors will argue at trial in front of the jury that... Kyle Rittenhouse was out there to assault people. The purpose to assault people was there to hunt humans. Well, yeah, with him making that statement in the preliminary hearing that he was there hunting humans, he's certainly going to put forth this argument in front of the jury that he was there with the purpose of assaulting people. He came there with a rifle that he shouldn't have had, and he came there with the intent to use it. I think that's what he's going to argue, although he charged recklessly, but his argument is going to be formulated upon him being there with the purpose of acting in the manner that he did. Rico tonight, hope he get, I hope he goes for a jury trial. Get a jury of his peers that are 18 or 19 years old to understand <laughs> his thought of mind at the time rather than 40 to 50 years old. Lawrence, uh, who's a better juror here for Kyle Rittenhouse? Uh, a group of teenagers sitting in the box or some, like, 40- or 50-year-old men? I don't think this is an age thing. I, I think it, you, need, you need people who understand the law of self-defense that aren't that understand firearms, that just because he had an AR doesn't make him a bad or dangerous person. Um, obviously, he went to a situation maybe that be questionable, that why did he bring his gun there? But, again, I keep saying if he legally had the firearm, it's a chaotic situation, but if they could show he's being attacked, he's, he could be justified. I don't think it doesn't mean he could have a 75 year old person on the jury. You just got to spell that out and show them that he was in fear, and here's why. And, and do what the lawyers did a little bit today at the prelim show those photos, show the video, make the jury feel the chaos and smell what's going on and the smoke and the screaming. And it's just and why he was afraid of these people and what happened. They attacked him. He ran towards the police. That last video you showed showed him running to the police. He wasn't running from them. He thought he was justified. Final comment tonight from Jeffrey who says, hashtag premeditated murder. Crossing state lines with an assault rifle sums it up. His mother should be charged too. A lot of people saying that, uh, but didn't cross state line with the assault rifle. He got that in Wisconsin. Lawrence Zimmerman, Renee Hill, Jennifer Brandt, always, always a great job. Thank you all so much, and uh, we'll have you back real soon here on the program. All right, Thank folks, you. that's Thanks, it for Jimmy. me tonight. I'll be here tomorrow night, 8 to 11, front row seat to justice. Have a great night, and as always, don't forget to hug your kids.